Look for a major event, I heard the Lord say, to take place in Las Vegas. I see some kind of, I think it's some kind of sickness. An epidemic, maybe. I saw an aircraft disaster, but I saw a missile blow one in half. New York, Siberia, volcano, and I saw a flood in India. The Lord said to us, meet me in the temple at the 11th hour.
is a thing that can be moved forward or be moved backward. He would say, how is that? Well, Joshua commanded the sun to stand still and the moon to stand still. Isaiah asked Hezekiah, do you want the sundial to go forward 10 degrees or backward 10 degrees? Hezekiah decided on backward. So time is a thing that can fluctuate. Time is a thing that can be hidden. Time is a thing that can be revealed. Time can be used as a revealer. Time can be used as a lot of things. Time is something that every defeat of every army and every existence of every single weapon of every kind finally succumbs to time. Because as time marches on, things begin to grow into obscurity. So time can reveal what was hidden in the past and what's hidden in the future. And time is about to reveal some past hidden secrets around the world. It's going to shake up a lot of important men. It's going to shake up a lot of important people in this country, a lot of politicians, when things in the past are being revealed into the present and, in, and shaping future. For now time, time, time has a voice and time is, get, is beginning to get into a place. How? Time is beginning to move into a place. It could be this close to being bitter. Why? Because there will be a time when time will be no more. And time sees its time diminishing. Sees its time leaving. And so time has is, is only got a short period to reveal all the secrets in it. And those secrets that are not washed in the blood and covered by the blood will be revealed. So you're about to see men of high political rank become very afraid as time flexes its muscle. And the mirror they look into begins to wave like water as time begins to change. It's going to change. Hallelujah. Talking about time.
of time. Time has a voice. Time has a voice to be heard. of time, the movement of time. The Lord's talking a lot about time right now. A lot about time. Time is, is different. I heard while we were singing that time is it's almost as if it's real close to being bitter about something because there will be a time when it will be no more. And just like everything else in creation, time was created and the creation became subject to vanity by the fall of a man. And so creation became subject to its own vanity in its own places. Grass seems to want to take over everything and weeds. You see 
things like that happen. You see the seas try to rebel. You see, you see weather going wild. And time has a, it's about that close to being, wanting its own voice because it knows there'll be a time when it'll be no more. So it has to, it's going to reveal secrets of men who were assassinated, men who were, the secrets are going to come out now. And no one, and people will say, who did it? Is there a mole? Is there this? No. Time did it. Time did it. Time began to do something. And time employ, employs the wind. And time will employ the wind, and the wind will blow and uncover something in the dirt. And someone will see it. And time revealed it. Time has a power that can erode the earth. <clears throat> time, all weapons of war are subject to time. It'll, they'll finally rust or rot or disappear and finally be used, can never be used again. And time is employing its forces right now because everything will be fulfilled before the end comes. Beware. Beware, wicked men and women, politicians and tyrants around the world because time is not on your side. Time is not on your side. Time is your enemy. And you think, well, we'll seal this document. We'll seal that document. It'll not come out to this time. And when that time comes, we'll seal it again. And we'll do this and we'll do that and we'll do that. Do what you think you must. But time will say to the wind, come and blow and the wind will blow and suddenly something will be uncovered time will say show and tell it's the time for show and tell righteousness is making a push into the earth and it will push in and there will be a revival and it will be a great time for the body of Christ it'll be a great time for the world because the world will thrive on the prosperity and the righteousness that God brings. Hallelujah. But time is going to be a weapon in the end of its own. If you knew you were going to disappear and demise, would you not fight back at some point? Time is, will be no more one day. And it will be of no relevance at all. And so the vanity it was made subject to now we'll employ earthquakes that will shake and uncover things, wind that will blow and uncover things, riches that were in the hands of some, it'll be shown that it'll not be in their hands anymore, it'll be transferred over to some other hands. And things like that will begin to happen. And just when the kingdom of hell, just when things were going good for it, time shot it down. Boom. And so time is... Is here, but not here to stay, but it's here today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We'll be right back after this to see what God is going to do in His Word, what He wants to tell us.
I want to welcome you back to the 11th hour today. It's a special 11th hour. All of them are special. And today is going to be a, a time we want to talk about some things. And God, God told me to start singing about time today. Time, and we've already learned some revelation knowledge about time just a few moments ago. Hallelujah. I want us to look at Genesis 3, and we'll start in verse 13. Now, Lord, I ask you to give us eyes to see and ears to hear that we can learn your word together as a family. I give you praise and honor and glory for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, Genesis 3, 13, we'll start there. And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, Thou art cursed above all cattle, above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. Then verse 15, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Now, I want you to... Um, I want you to really think about what I'm going to tell you next, that we're going to be talking today about the kingdom of deception, the kingdom of deception. The Lord spoke that into my heart yesterday, the kingdom of deception, and gave me those scriptures. And I want you to notice what the woman said. She said that the serpent beguiled her. A kingdom of deception is a government of beguilement. A kingdom of deception, its government, its governing is beguilement. Now, beguilement means to lead astray. It means mentally to delude or morally to seduce. Beguile, deceive greatly and utterly. It's used as the word deceived, greatly, uh, in here beguiled me. It's also used as the word seize and utterly. The word utterly keeps showing up. Now, the dictionary defines uh, from Oxford languages and so forth, utterly as an adverb, and I'm no English scholar. I'm, I'm just, I can talk English Completely and without qualification, absolutely. Now listen to this definition. To an, this is of utterly. To an absolute or extreme degree, to the full extent, in an utter manner, absolutely, entirely, totally. Just when you're expecting to hear something trite or ordinary, rich invents a tasty, utterly charming piece of ear candy. And that's something. Now you know what happened that day. That day was not the first day the woman had talked to the serpent. I mean, think about it. Adam and his wife, they communicated with the animals constantly. That's probably where you get all the legends of Dr. Doolittle and things like that. They communicated with the animals. It wasn't that the animals could speak their language, but they could speak theirs. This was before sin entered the earth. But that day, the woman was expecting a trite or ordinary conversation. But instead, the serpent spoke to her of rich invents 
and fed her a tasty, utterly charming piece of ear candy. That serpent began to deceive the woman and lead her astray by diluting what God himself had said. And that serpent began to seduce the woman morally. This is how the officers of the kingdom of deception operate. That's the way they operate. This kingdom was set up in Genesis 3. Its whole job, or at least among men, its whole job is to deceive, to greatly deceive, and listen to this, and seize what it can. And you just learned at, the, at that tree, talking to that woman, is where the sickness of seizures came into being. This kingdom is to utterly beguile and deceive, to lead astray mentally to delude, a kingdom morally to seduce. The kingdom of deception began in the world before Adam was ever created. It's recorded in Isaiah 14, when the seed of the serpent was prophesied from the mouth of the anointed cherub. The government of the kingdom of deception is beguilement. It was implemented among men in the garden that day when the serpent was speaking to the woman, and it continues to this day. Now, listen close to this. It's too weak without deception. It's too weak. Everything and everyone in it runs on deception. They can't believe one word each other speaks in their kingdom. And you can't believe one word any of those in that kingdom say. It is a kingdom of anxiety because you have to second guess everything and what everyone in it says. So it's a kingdom of anxiety. It is all to bring in the seed of the serpent. Now, I hope everybody's listening to all this and it's making sense to you. We're talking about the kingdom of deception. Now, I want you to listen to this part. The kingdom of deception grows. It grows. Every fungus grows. Every, uh, a cancer can grow if it's given the right environment. Sickness grows if it's given the right environment. Cut off its life source and it dies. The kingdom of deception grows and becomes more proficient at beguilement as it increases. Now, because it is so weak, it takes more and more chances. As Satan sees the time approaching, now we've been talking about time. As Satan sees time, the time approaching, the enemy will try and shove it into position quickly. When he sees time starting, the time starting to shut down or starting to approach, he tries to shove it into position quickly, this thing he's trying to set up, because he is afraid he will lose his opportunity if he don't. Therefore, he takes chances and runs the risk of tipping his hand and those created in the image of God seeing through it. So he gets in a panic. He begins to, to try to do things quickly. He knows he has but a short time. He operates in great fury in that time, when that time comes. And he does this. And when he does, he starts taking extra chances. And when he starts taking these chances, he runs a risk of tipping his hand to those created in the image of God. And he risked them seeing through it. The beguilement was brought to great heights with COVID-19. Then was the seed of the serpent brought among men with the help of deluded lies. Elaborate and careful plans were made. Years before all of this happened, DNA testing became an almost absolute craze among the populace. Spit in a cup, send it off. Find out your ancestry. Not many people ever thinking of how dangerous it could be if your DNA samples fell into the hands of governments. I mean, what if your DNA samples 
for instance, ended up in a laboratory, oh, I don't know, say in China? I don't know. Well, anyway, a sickness comes on the scene after all of the years of that that targets certain weaknesses and so forth. A sickness seized men's minds and diluted their thoughts. Men became afraid that it would wipe out the world, and from that authority was seized. People were led astray and mentally attacked. They were told what was essential, what was not essential. They were told to stand six feet apart. They were told they had to wear a mask and do a restaurant until they sat down at the table. Then they could take it off as if COVID would chase you to your table, hoping you would let down your mask before you got there so it could get you. Ridiculous things. People fought over toilet paper. Their food was limited in grocery stores while ships full of provision were sitting off our coast. They were threatened to be put in jail if they held church services. Some were completely against our Constitution. Curfews were placed on people, violating all our rights, but people followed it. I think it was Klaus Schwab, the head of the World Economic Forum, who said that COVID was a test, and people gave up enormous rights. People's vision got involved when Hollywood got involved. Now we see deep fakes. Now there's reports of fake White House sets and so forth. It's the kingdom of deception. But with the kingdom of deception, now all that sounds like a bleak thing, but you know it's true. You know it's all true. If it's not, if it's not true, then tell me, why are we telling you little uh, boys they can, they're, they're really little girls, and little girls, they're really little boys, and why are we going to such elaborate ways to change and, and mutilate the genitals of each one to try to change their genders, and we tell them, you can identify with this, or you can identify with this. If you're a boy, you can identify with a girl. If you're a girl, you can identify with a boy, or you can identify with another species of being. Is that not the kingdom of deception and beguilement? Well, sure. So you know a spirit is behind all of this. There is a spirit lurking in the shadows who's afraid time is about to elude him and about to run out. Because think about this. On this earth, even time has domination over Satan because he knows his time is short. I bet that chaps his behind. But with the kingdom of deception, and here's where we start walking into the light. But with the kingdom of deception comes divine intervention from the kingdom of light. This is the counter to Satan's plan. It's as simple as a stone in the forehead of Satan's champion. <laughs> in this chapter we just read, Genesis 3, where the kingdom of deception instituted the government of beguilement among men, also, this is where it happened, but also in this same chapter, divine intervention was given. Let's look at Genesis 3. Now watch this. And we'll look at this now. Let's read it again. 13, 14, and 15. And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me. That's the government of the kingdom of deception being pushed into the realm of men. And I did eat. So now that government was dominating her. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. The serpent and those that follow the serpent should be reminded of that. The serpent will eat dust all the days of its life, crawls on its belly. Those that follow the serpent will one day put, be put below the dust where they have no 
more say. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. Listen now. And it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. That was the prophecy the Lord God gave to intervene into the kingdom of deception and into the government of beguilement. The Lord God came with a prophetic word. It was the prophetic word that the seed of the woman was coming, the Christ, the son of the living God. He would come and be crucified and crush your head and crush your government of beguilement and you'll bruise his heel and of the Christ government, Isaiah said, there will be no end. So think about it. It was this prophetic word from the Lord God that guided the stone to Goliath's forehead. It's a prophetic word that did it. It's the prophetic word that is the intervention. Oh, somebody got to catch this. It's the prophetic word that intervened. The kingdom of deception moves ahead and thinks they have it this time. They think it's all sewed up, that there's no way to fail, not realizing that they were failures from the beginning, that you are on a losing side. Just when they think they have it, the Lord God gives a prophetic word and divine intervention takes place. It upsets their plans and changes the course of nature. James 3, 6 says, And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members that it defileth the whole body and setteth on fire the course of nature and it is set on fire of hell. This is talking about the prophetic word. A prophet not only brings a word from God, but also they bring a word for the people to start saying. Why? Because it's prophetic and the tongue that sets on fire the course of nature. The tongue that starts nature moving is speaking. People wonder why it seems that the kingdom of deception always has to tell their plans before they do them. Have you ever noticed that? They always tell it. Movies will come out and that will, that will proclaim it and show it and give a vision to the people. Why, does, why do they want a vision given to the people? So they'll start talking about it. They're trying to use the tongue and set it on fire of hell to start the course of nature moving to their deception, to their vision. This is why people say, well, Satanists and all these people always have to tell what they're going to do before they do it. It's, it's not that they just are forced to. They do it because they're trying to set your tongue on fire from hell so that everyone will start talking about it. And once the tongue starts, it starts the course of nature moving, and it will move toward their plans. They will get you talking about it because it's the, it's the tongue that sets on fire the course of nature and it is the tongue that is set on fire of hell. They always tell it because they want to get you prophesying it. The prophecy of Genesis 3.15 about the seed of the woman, it was not only for them to hear, but it was also for Adam and his wife to begin to say. They did start saying it because look at the genealogy of Genesis 5. Where it says, and Adam begot Seth, and Seth begot Enos, and Enos begot Mahalalil, or Kayanam, and Kayanam begot Mahalalil, and so on, all the way to Noah. Translating the Hebrew words, it kind of comes down to this. For man's sorrow, there will come a substituted mortal. The great God will come down out of heaven teaching, and his death will bring the despairing rest. Adam and his wife not only heard the prophetic word, but they began to say it. And people started talking about the seed of the woman, the seed of the woman, the seed of the woman. In St. John 1, 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among men. Nature and everything in creation began to move to set that up. Even the kingdom, watch now, of deception said, tax the people. And Mary and Joseph went to Bethlehem. <laughs> 
everything began to, to guide creation toward that. Think about it. The Tower of Babel, they had made it until one prophetic word, Babel. They had it all together. What was the strength of Babel to that, that tower and that kingdom of deception that Nimrod had? It was Genesis 3.15. Everything, that's the guidance system that directed the stone to Goliath's head. That's the prophecy that, that confused the languages. That's the prophecy that stopped uh, Athaliah from killing all the seed royal and destroying Josiah from which the Messiah would come. That's the prophecy that kept David safe. That's the prophecy that kept Mary and Joseph safe. That's the prophecy that kept it all safe because it came into the earth and one prophetic word released in the earth is the nightmare of the kingdom of deception and the government of beguilement. One prophetic word. Remember the scripture said, the Lord God said, now nothing will be impossible of all they've planned to do until one prophetic word, babble, confusion. And confusion hit and they were scattered. What was the strength of it? Genesis 3.15, the seed of the woman's coming. And Babel was in the way. Ba uh, the tower of Babel was in the way. It was just in the way. And so what, 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 at the Red Sea, they had to cross. Why did Moses and the children of Israel have to cross the Red Sea? Why was it so imperative that they cross? And they were facing a mount across the other side called Baal Zephon, where the god Baal had a high place. And God called Baal out on the, on the battlefield that, at that moment. Why did, was it so imperative that they had to cross the Red Sea? Because the seed of the woman was coming. They had to cross. They always have this prophecy to contend with through the Scripture. Well, now you see why the prophetic voice is so important today. They had to cross because Israel, the land of Canaan, lied on the other side over there. They had to go and, and come to possess the land so that Messiah could come. All of it being directed, every dream Joseph had, every move someone made, everything they did to that point, all the way up to the birth in that stable, came from Genesis 3.15. And the kingdom of deception and the government of beguilement even though they had flooded the world with false gods. They were offering human sacrifice and human blood, but nothing could stop that one prophetic word. And everything was being controlled and moving because someone was saying the seed of the woman's coming, the seed of the woman's coming. And every time they did it, it echoed the voice of the Lord God in the earth. And all of creation said, yes, no matter what happens. Absalom running from uh, overthrowing David's throne. I want you to think about it just a minute. I want you to listen to what I'm telling you. Why did the water stand up and part for Moses? Because the prophecy started creation moving. It started the creation moving. And when Moses got to the Red Sea, if Pharaoh had have killed them all on that side or I'd have taken them into bondage or killed them all, then the prophecy couldn't happen. But nature had already been set on its course from the, the mouth of the Lord God. Seed of the woman's coming. The seed of the woman's coming. The seed of the woman prophesied the virgin birth and the crucifixion was when his heel came down on the serpent's head. The seed of the woman's coming. The seed of the woman's coming. And, the, and it ordered nature to react. So when Moses got there, the Lord God said, all you got to do is stretch your hand out over that sea. It's already waiting. It will obey you. Boom, it stood up on both sides and froze itself, turned to jello walls by God in the middle of the sea. In the middle of a desert, 
dried the floor of it so you could see dust from the sandals and the animal's hooves as they walked through it. And a fire separated Pharaoh from Moses and a dark cloud at night. It kept them dark but lit the way for, for Moses. It's because the prophecy had started the course of nature moving. When Absalom overthrew David's kingdom and David had to run and cross the Jordan, that's very prophetic, he crossed the Jordan. But when he crossed the Jordan, he came to the place where Elijah would, was caught away, would be caught away, where Moses was buried. There's power there. David crossed over on the other side. And when he got to the other side, the earth recognized this is the one that the seed of the woman will come through him. This is him. So Satan raised up an Absalom spirit to go and destroy him. And he split a kingdom. But when they got over there, watch this. The scripture's very plain to say when the war started in the woods of Ephraim. And the war started there. It said more were killed by the woods than they were the sword. The earth fought. Nature had been pushed into, its, into action because David was in their midst. The seed of the woman. The seed of the woman is the prophecy of the Lord God. Fight, fight, fight. And the wood started killing people. And then Absalom jumped on his mule, his hybrid donkey. And he ran through the woods Thought he was going to get away, but the boughs of an oak grabbed him by the hair as he went under it. It was like that big oak tree when the wood and the ground was busy fighting all the enemy's armies trying to stop the Genesis 3.15 from happening. And all of a sudden they're trying to stop it. And Absalom, the one who's heading it up, starts running away. It's like the trees called out into the wood and said, he's getting away. He's getting away. And all of them tried to reach and get him. But the boughs of the big oak focused in on him and said, I got him. And when he went under the limb, the boughs of the oak grabbed him by the hair and lifted him up off the, the hybrid mule, the donkey and horse. And the mule walked on. And he held him there dangling. And he couldn't free himself. No matter what he tried to do, he could not get his hair loose. Do you realize what kind of grip that was? Why didn't he just draw a knife and cut his hair loose? He was so full of vanity. He wouldn't dare cut his hair. The scripture said he weighed it every year and cut it by weight. He couldn't mess up that. And his vanity hung him there. And then Joab came. And the other soldiers and thrust him through with darts. And he died. And David crossed back over. So if you feel like you've been pushed across the Jordan, you've been pushed across the river or whatever it was, whatever river David crossed, but I'm using the Jordan as the crossing point. And if you believe, you feel like you've been pushed back over, remember, on the other side of the river is where power is. Hallelujah. Now you know why the prophetic voice is so important today. If you do not think that you're living in a kingdom of deception, then look at a few things. It tells girls they are boys and boys they are girls. Bing. It tells them they can identify with another gender or species for that matter and be treated as if they are that gender or that species. Is this not a kingdom of deception? It is a kingdom where deception is spared no expense in being elaborate to deceive the people. We see someone in the highest office in the land who can't string three sentences together one day and the next day he speaks fluidly 
And we are supposed to believe that there is no deception going on. You see this in every walk of life now. In ministry, it shows up a lot. People you thought was really with you. And you trusted had another agenda the whole time. They are part of the kingdom of deception. Government lies to the people so much that they don't even know what the truth is. Look at the pandemic. To those who know, well, you, you shouldn't, you ain't got any, any medical right to talk about the pandemic. No, but I tell you what, by God, I gave the prophet. know anything about it. Well, I was qualified to tap into the spirit and hear it. And then in April 30th, 2019, I heard it again and heard it would be used as by unscrupulous men. So don't look at me and tell me I don't have a right to say the word pandemic when I heard it before you knew it existed. And so did other prophets. Not just me, but I can't speak for them. I have to speak for me. So I do have the right to utter those words. I may not be a medical person, but I'm qualified in the spirit to tell you more about it than Fauci is. Look at the pandemic. To those who know the spiritual side of it, it was all the demonic employed by government to bring about calamity. They need to employ the spiritual because without employing the kingdom, without employing the spiritual, the kingdom of deception, in the kingdom of deception, the people will see right through it. The kingdom of deception is very elaborate. It includes most of Hollywood, almost all of politics, everything unclean and everything immoral. It includes anything that touches a lie, anything. Let me talk about good people for a minute. Good people can be recruited by this kingdom to work for them. But of course, they are mostly deceived and think that they are doing God a favor. When in actuality, they are selling out their own future to a cubicle of land and provision. In the Revolutionary War, when America was gaining independence, they would have been considered Tories in the spirit. They're Tories. For instance, look at a modern generation. Now, I speak of the church. I'm speaking of the church, the body of Christ. A generation like those in the Methodist church who would give their posterity over to abomination and secure their position in hell. This is the most guilty of all. For such people are the ones who will grant access of the Antichrist to come into their midst to devour their children. Holiness has been forgotten by them and only when they cry from their bondage will they think of me again, says the Lord. So now we see, now we can see the importance of a prophetic word. A prophetic word given by prophets in the land or the intervention from heaven. They're the intervention that upsets the kingdom of deception. It's the intervention that disrupts the government of beguilement. Prophecy, the prophetic word, is the intervention of it all. That's what God gives to intervene into the kingdom of deception. And right now, there's prophets all around the world, not just in America, but all around the world. And they're seeing victory. And they're prophesying victory. Don't you understand? Noah Harari said it'll be like a screen pulled down one day and overnight everything would just change. Well, your screen has no, has, uh, don't amount to much if the projector's busted. And a prophetic word is the stone that will knock it off its perch. You were a loser from the beginning. From Genesis 3.15, the kingdom of deception lost. From Genesis 3.15, the outcome was determined. 
And if you couldn't stop Jesus from rising from the dead, then when the rest of it's prophesied, it is already determined. You can't defeat the resurrection. If you could have, you would have done it 2,000 years ago. But you can't do it. You can't do it. And religious people begin to give themselves to work for the kingdom of deception and the government of beguilement. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. You ought to be ashamed. Some of you have such potential you could join the fight and we could do the right things and see it all turn on every side and avoid so much that you would rather offer your children on the sacrificial altar of blood to the devil by selling them out to have their genitals changed or support those that do it or stand up and ordain homosexuality in your pulpits an abomination to the Lord. Well, the Lord, the Lord loves. Love has, loving someone has nothing to do with it being an abomination. He wants them to change, but it is an abomination. It's because you can't give birth out of the anus of a man. It won't produce life. It won't produce life. And two women together won't produce life. So it's an abomination to the Lord. The, the Lord, God in seed, plant, harvest, life. He said it's a man and a woman is the picture of God. The man, the father figure. The woman, the Holy Ghost figure who gives birth. But Jesus, the word is the seed. So it takes the father, the seed, and the mother to produce life. Hallelujah. Now you just go ahead and get some mad, you quiver. Just shake all over for all I care. Because nothing changes the truth. The truth will stand when the world's on fire. Hallelujah. And it is the truth. You will know the truth. It's not just the truth that makes you free, makes you free. It's the truth you know that will make you free. And right now you're looking at, at wicked men in the kingdom of deception don't even realize they're being tried by the court of heaven all over the land. Everything they're doing to Donald Trump, they're being tried, not him. Everything that's going on in our moral and ethical laws that you're trying to change to be some kind of belligerent fool. Make them out of, make everybody belligerent fools out here and look like buffoons everywhere they go. All you're really doing is you're being tried. You're messing with a document inspired by God in the Declaration of Independence in the U.S. Constitution, and yet you want to change all of that. You're the one being tried, and right now you're in that time of trials and it's amazing that how David thought when Nathan came to him about the man with the the two men with the sheeps the sheepfold and the one little ewe lamb how David thought he was passing judgment on the wicked man who's supposed to have killed the you the one little ewe lamb of the poor man David thought he was on trial, but he wasn't. David was on trial. And the prophet said, thus saith the Lord. Actually, Nathan looked at him and said, thou art the man. And I'm looking at people today in government. I don't know who you are. The Lord hasn't shown me. But if you're involved in the kingdom of deception, thou art the man. Hallelujah. It's been a good 11th hour today, hasn't it? It's been a heavy 11th hour today. It's been an 11th hour that I won't apologize for. And I won't back up on it. And uh, because the Lord wanted a word given. Take it up with the Almighty if you don't like it. Well, you know.
you know, brother, it don't make any difference. It's already in the air. Take it up with him. Take it up with him. Let's see what he tells you about it. It's going to be amazing how he'll say the same things you heard today. Because this never changes. No wonder they want to rewrite it. Hallelujah. Come on, Kristen, receive our offering today. And uh, it's already been good to be with you today on the 11th hour. And uh, the Lord is doing some things. He's doing some time trials right now. Time trials. And uh, time is running out, so people have a short time to repent. And I'm talking about wicked people and things like that that know what they're doing. You know, it's hard for people to believe, Krista, that, that there are people that are that know what they're doing. There's those that are deceived. Right. You know, the woman was deceived, but the man was not deceived. So who was the most wicked at that moment? Right. The woman deceived or the man who was not? No, no, no. It'd have to be the man who was not deceived. So there are those who are deceived. And yet through the woman, even because she was deceived, it kept her womb, her womb clean. And she could give birth to the Messiah. But the man could not provide the seed. Because he was not deceived and committed treason. Rebellion against heaven. Treason against the Most High. So we're talking to several different kind of people today. There are those that are deceived. Then there's those that are not. And those that are not, those that are deceived are looking for mercy. And God will show it. Those that are deceived, you're on a time trial. And you are on a limited time to get it right. You're going to see a lot of things change in the next few weeks, two or three weeks maybe. It's going to be really big. Things in the earth. Now look for events. Weather is, weather is mad. Weather and time is, is marching weather around where it should go. Prophetic words were given and called for the weather to fight, wind to blow where it needs to blow, fire to be where it needs to be, earth to shake where it needs to shake, different things like that. Yeah. Uh, there's time is, is doing things. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Pray for the people in all these places, yeah. and especially for the little ones, for they've done nothing wrong, right. but yet they're, they're beginning to be a brunt of people older than them. They're receiving because of them. You know. But any anybody, any nation who will give a give their unborn to be slaughtered like like so much cattle would surely not think of sacrificing them. Right. Hallelujah. Well, hallelujah. <laughs> what do you say after that? Well, it's offering time here on the 11th hour. <laughs> Praise God. If uh, you feel led to sow today, if, if you have your seed ready, then you can go to robindbullock.com. The ways to give are on the screen. Also, if you're mailing in your offering, that address is available for you there also. You know, as you're getting your, your seed together today, uh, you know, I just keep going. Uh, I keep going back to, to what Terry Tripp preached Sunday on the offering, which was just absolutely phenomenal. Such a, such a revelation of God. And, and what, what a weekend that, that we had at Church International this, this past weekend. I mean, 300-plus three, people making a public declaration to consecrate their life to Jesus. And um, that is just so historic and monumental to be a part of. But you know what? It takes, do you know every bit of that this weekend took money to do? Every bit of it. It took money to buy the swimming pools that we baptize people in. It took money to fill it up. Um, 
It took money to um, bring the food trucks in. Uh, it took money to uh, have the sound, the, the PA that was out there took money, number one, to buy. But it also increases the power because you're using it to run it. There was nothing that happened this weekend that money did not touch. But every penny was worth it. Because you cannot put a price on somebody's soul and somebody's life to consecrate their life as a public statement of faith to consecrate their life to Jesus. You can't put a price on it. That's why we don't charge when we go places. You can't put a price on it. And Terry was talking Sunday about God determining the value of a seed. He said he doesn't determine value like you and I determine value. Because he owns everything. He owns it all. Everything is his. And how many times have I touched on exactly what Terry was talking about Sunday, about how it is your obedience that determines the magnitude of your seed. It's your obedience. And that could be $5. It, it doesn't matter. So what I'm saying is all of that, that was just 300 people that was in the parking lot of Church International. That was just 300 people. There's a whole world out there. An entire world. And you know, of course, there were thousands on the other side of the camera Saturday night and Sunday morning watching, but that's just a drop in the bucket compared to what we've got to reach. And it's going to take finances to do it. If it takes finances just to fill up two swimming pools outside to baptize people in, what do you think it's going to take to go ye into all the world and preach the gospel? You know, Roxanne's son Luke was pitching a fit the other night. As we say in the South, we pitch a fit when we're little. Kids be pitching a fit over something. Because she would not load him up in the car and fly him to Japan to go to Nintendo Land. And he was having a full-blown meltdown that he could not go to Japan that day. And he didn't know, he didn't understand why. Now he's only five. He did not understand why he could not go to Japan to go see Mario and Luigi. He just could not understand it. And I told uh, Nancy Alcorn about it, and she said, you know, well, he don't want for much, does he? And I said, just one of the most expensive trips there is is to go to Japan. Did you know that God wants us to be able to go to Japan and preach the gospel? He wants us to be able, if he says, I need you to go to Japan. I need you to go. He needs us to be in a place where we can say, Sir, yes, sir, and go. And Japan ain't a cheap place to go to. It's not cheap. It's not cheap at all. Anywhere in Asia, hardly, is not cheap at all to go to. But he expects the body of Christ to be able to go. We cannot be the hands and feet of Jesus if we're stationary and we never move. We can't be the hands of Jesus if we're just standing with him behind our back. We can't be the feet of Jesus if we just stay in one place constantly. Yes, we're stationed in Warrior, Alabama, but we're still commissioned to go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And if it takes just doing it on this side of the camera, then so be it. But that takes finances to do it. And it takes finances for you to go. 
And so this is why God wants us to prosper. But we've got to get it out. We've got, like Terry said, we've got to get out of the realm of just giving, but into the precious giving, which means it's the obedience of our heart. It's our heart that determines it. We don't just want to get, we don't want to sow and sow our seed all the time just to benefit ourselves and to prosper ourselves and to get rich ourselves. You should be in the mindset of, I am blessed to be a blessing. I've got to get into the realm of the precious seed because, God, I want to sow my seed to be able to go to Japan if I'm called to go because there are souls waiting and I need to get there. Because you could be the person to reach one person over in Japan who ends up changing the nation. This is where we've got to get to and get out of the Judas network. Get out, get out of that. Get out of the you could have sold that and given it to the poor. Get out of the, the love of money. Well, we've got to do this. So crunching numbers. There's nothing wrong with being financially secure and there's nothing wrong with being wise about your money and finances. But you crunch numbers too much and you start to get in fear of it. It's a piece of paper. And your father owns all of it. He owns every bit of it. Get out. Being in the place of the fear of money is being in the Judas network. Judas was afraid of money, which means he loved money at the same time. It's all the same thing. The love of money is the fear of not having it. It's all the same thing. Because you love it so much, you'll do anything it take, that you have to to get it because you don't want to be without it. It's the same, it operates under the same thing. And that means when you give... Out of that, you're not giving in the right heart. And you're not giving in the right spirit. And that's not an offering that touches God. But saying, God, I'm ready to go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. I want to see 300 baptized. I had a pastor tell me the other day, he said, I don't think I've baptized 300 people in my life. And you guys did in one day. And do you know that's a small baptism? There's churches. There's, there's a, a Pastor Greg Laurie's church in California baptizing thousands. John the Baptist did it his whole life. So I, I'm just grateful to have been a part of the 300. That, that'll preach in more ways than one right there. I'm grateful to be a part of the 300, no matter what. So when we get ourselves in the right heart, the right spirit, and then we give to God, that is an offering that He can do something with. And so today, let's move out of this category into the obedience, the precious seed. Leave Judas alone. Just ditch him like a hot rock. Leave him alone because we got work to do because it is getting intense. It's getting intense out there. And you and I, we've got a job to do and we need to be doing it. So somebody, somebody will probably go to Japan after all, all that I just talked about. You watch. And when you do, if it's one of you, let us know. Write in and let us know, hey, I went to Japan and preached the gospel. If the Lord tells you to go, don't just jump on a plane today and say, I've got to go to Japan. <laughs> but today as you hold your seat up, Lord, we position our hearts today to be in the right place. Lord, create in us a clean heart and renew a right spirit within us. Lord, today we stand obedient to what you've called us to do. 
Lord, this seed, that this precious seed that they're giving today, Lord, they heard you, they were obedient. And so, Lord, I ask you today to look upon their seed today as a precious gift. And, Lord, bless their lives exceeding abundant above all that they could ask or think. And, Lord, I thank you for the team that we have on the other side of that camera. The team that can go and, and, and minister in places that we can't go and minister. Lord, I thank you that we're all partners and we're all family and we're in this together. And Lord, we will see lives changed. And Lord, I give you praise for it today. In Jesus' name. Now, Lord, according to your word in Luke 6, 38, you said, As we give, it shall be given unto them good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over shall men give unto their bosom. For with the same measure that they meet with all, it shall be measured to them again. Lord, we believe that. We call that done in their life. In Jesus' name. Now Malachi 3.10 for the tither says, Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house. And prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sake, and he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground, neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, saith the Lord of hosts, and all nations shall call you blessed, for you shall be a delightsome land, saith the Lord of hosts. Say, I believe it, I receive it, I call it done in Jesus' name. Amen. So be it. Roxanne, we got praise reports today. Yes. 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 Well, I just took that Japan intervention that I had with him as a teaching moment to teach him about how to sew if he wants to go to Japan one day because he thinks Mario and Luigi are real life. So so we had a we had a come to Jesus moment about Japan the other night. So <laughs> we thank you so much for sending your praise reports this week. Continue to send them in through robindbullock.com. Go through the prompts, send them in, let us know what God's doing in your country, in the US, all around the world so that we can rejoice with you in your victory. Amen. So this one comes from a partner that says um, they had a traffic ticket resolved in their favor and all charges were dropped the other day. So praise God for that. <laughs> and they say also they had recently rented a rental truck to move some furniture. I rented it out with a full tank of gas, drove around the entire place, did everything we had to do. And when I returned the truck, the tank was still full. I don't know how that truck moved, but that gas needle never budged at all during the whole drive. Because of that, I was able to save the money on gas. So praise the Lord. The Lord kept the gas tank full that day. Hallelujah. This one says, uh, blessings. I have a praise report. I'm a ministry partner and uh, absolutely love you all so much. I watch regularly from California. I heard the Holy Spirit prompt me to give more this week than I usually do with my tithes and offerings. And as I opened, let me get my page here. As I opened the phone and the app to give, Satan right away came in and started pointing out this, that, or the other. You don't need to do this. You don't need to do that. All the things that have to be repaired on our house and so on. So, and this tells you this is 11th hour partner. They say, so I said to the devil, oh yeah, watch me give scumbag and choke on it. <laughs> so, <laughs> they said... Uh, anyways, I gave double what I felt and then gave to some under, other ministries as well. The next day, I went from $27 in my one account to 180 because of a glitch. Then yesterday, we received a $3,000 check towards our real estate retirement business that we never expected. It's, uh, it's an over and above what we should get once we move forward with the sale. And they said, God is so amazing. And uh, I feel like he's not done yet. It said, I also sent a couple of books to two friends who are on a limited income. I knew the Lord wanted them to have these books. And that was when I opened the check for our, uh, from our mail yesterday. Thank you for all you do, and we love and pray for you all. So praise God. <laughs> they stuck it to Satan that day. Amen? That's our 11th hour family. This one also says, thank you so much for praying with me for my husband's salvation. Today he prayed the salvation prayer after your church service. 
God is absolutely good, and with God all things are possible. I'm still in awe for this sudden miracle. Thank you so much for your obedience and all that you do. May God richly bless you all. So praise God for his salvation. And this last one says, I want to send a praise report to you guys. Thank you for praying. My biopsies came back normal. So hallelujah. So we praise God for all of these praise reports. Thank you for sending them in. We rejoice with you today. We rejoice that you have victory in your life today. And we're praising with you. Hallelujah. That is so awesome. Praise God. Somebody ought to give the Lord a hand. Somebody ought to give him a praise. Thank you, Lord, for delivering our partners and, Lord, touching people's lives around the world. Thank you, Lord, that we get to be such a, you know, Lord, just a, a small part of what you're doing. You're, you're doing huge things. You're doing big things in their lives, and we get to be a small part of that, Lord God, just to get to be a part of it at all is a wonderful thing. So we thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for our partners. Thank you. Hallelujah. Well, it's been a good 11th hour today, don't you think? Hallelujah. We probably made all hell mad, and, and, uh, and, and the darkness probably don't know what to do right now. If you hear any crashes in the darkness, it's demons running into each other. Hallelujah. Well, I want you to know... Well, you know what? We ain't done this today, have we? You need to be born again if you've never been born again. Oh, my goodness. That's the biggest thing you could ever do. I mean, do you know it takes more faith to be born again than it does anything else you'll ever need faith for? <clears throat> because you believe in your heart God raised Jesus from the dead, and you confess with your mouth that he's your Lord, and you'll be saved. Now, that takes more faith than anything else you'll ever have to do. And you know what? That goes to show you everybody receives the measure of faith. People say a measure, but that's not the way it's, it's worded. It's the measure. A measure means someone might have got more than someone else. But the measure is the measure of faith when you're born again. And if you use that faith and you apply that faith, it starts to grow. And faith can become great faith. And faith can become, it, it grows, and, and it, it can grow big till it moves mountains. Just a faith, that size of a mustard seed can move a mountain. Hallelujah. So why don't you pray that right now? Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Be my Lord and personal Savior. I believe God raised you from the dead. And I confess with my mouth right now, that you are my Lord. Cleanse me of all sin. Make me brand new. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Now, go ahead and get baptized in the Holy Ghost. That means you, you see what happens when you got saved is the Holy Ghost baptized you in Jesus. Now, Jesus wants to baptize you in the Holy Ghost in fire with the evidence of speaking in other tongues, the language that God and Adam spoke to one another in before Adam ever sinned. Isn't that amazing that that can be restored to us? It's the language of the Spirit. The language of the Spirit. And, um, and God can understand every word when he hears it. Amen. So just say this, Lord Jesus, baptize me in the mighty Holy Ghost and fire with the evidence of speaking in other tongues as the Spirit tells me what to say. Now just start thanking him for it. Thank him for it. Thank you, Jesus, for baptizing me in the Holy Ghost. And now whatever sounds you hear, whatever sounds you're, he, he, you hear inside, you just say, Just start. Start releasing it out of your mouth right now. Esto perquio le embrondo ganzele quiste parote oroma quiste hale friendo cochesnele cande congalesi chi poroto o copoxne perquio to po pochiatele avrindo cobale che sia stecale andare caroba and just keep releasing that out of your mouth it'll put you in another place you'll begin to be in another place and you're praying mysteries hidden in God. Then you can pray, you interpret. 
You have a prayer language. You have a language that's giving out messages in tongues. You can pray, you interpret, and the Lord will tell you what you say. But when you need an answer, you don't know what to pray. Or you've prayed in English to the point you don't know what else to say. Shift over into that language, and you can pray infinitely. And you'll start praying the answers. The, the Holy Ghost joins with you, comes alongside the paraclete, comes alongside to help, and begins to take hold together with you against your infirmities. And he knows the mind of God like you and I don't. And he searches every mystery hidden in the book, every mystery hidden in the scripture itself. He searches the mysteries. He searches the mysteries hidden in the mind of God. And then suddenly he can bring them up to your thinking and you know exactly what to do. Hallelujah. Hell don't like praying in other tongues because it don't understand what you're saying. Amen. But you do it. And if you got saved today, or you got baptized in the Holy Ghost, why don't you let us know? Let us know in the chat if you're watching, uh, wherever you're watching. Let us know in the chat. Email us, uh, write to us, uh, P.O. Box 67, Warrior, Alabama, 35180, and tell us what happened, how you got born again, you got baptized in the Holy Ghost. Request the book, Jesus, Why It Is the Way It Is. I need to keep one out here where I can show them what it looks like. Jesus, Why It Is the Way It Is. And we'll send that to you postpaid, absolutely free. And uh, if you're online, you can download it free. It won't cost you anything. Amen. It'll help you begin your walk with God. And I'm going to tell you, it's called Jesus, why it is the way it is. How come it has to be him and no one else? Amen. Well, until next time, we gather together right here around God's word. I want you to remember Never forget that God is absolutely good. Shalom.